But let's get into the Word today, and I'm going to ask you to uh, follow along because I think this is a, a very important message, not because I'm preaching it, it's from God's Word, but a, a very important message as we come to this uh, season uh, of the church calendar, if you will, the, the uh, time of year when we look forward to celebrating our resurrected Lord and Savior uh, at, at Easter. But uh, in Matthew 21, if you want to turn there, there'll be uh, slides here uh, that will help. But Matthew 21, a familiar passage, it's found in all four, uh, this is, story is found in all four of the Gospels. Uh, but I want to read Matthew 21, uh, verses 1 through 11. And you'll notice that... Uh, sprinkled in here are uh, some of the words of Jesus and I think it is that makes it just that much more important and so uh, we'll begin reading in verse 1 of Matthew 21 verses 1 through 11 and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethpage under the Mount of Olives then sent Jesus two disciples saying unto them go into the village over against you and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto, unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt of the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them uh, their clothes, and they set him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way, and the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was uh, coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. I noticed on your bulletin this morning that you have the corresponding passage from the Old Testament that we're going to be looking at, and that's very, very important from Zechariah 9, 9. But I've entitled the message this morning, The Tragedy of Palm Sunday. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me and pray, and just let that sink in. The Tragedy of of Palm Sunday. Lord, I pray that you just speak to our hearts, Lord, and that your word would ring true because it's already been mentioned to me this morning. Uh, it's all about you, and it's all about your word. And Lord, I just pray that you'd open our hearts to receive it now for your sake and the glory of uh, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we know that uh, context is important, right? Uh, and the reason I title this The Tragedy of Palm Sunday is, uh, as one uh, author had mentioned, it's really more about the dramatic approach than it is the triumphal entry. We think about Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry. It is a very dramatic approach, however, and it is tragic in the sense that the way the people in that day, and there was a mixture of people, but the way they received Jesus when he first entered upon the donkey. And of course, context is very important. And between Jesus telling his disciples he was going to Jerusalem to die, uh, even to where he, he drives the, the money changers uh, out from the temple, and then in the uh, corresponding passages we, we learn that he leaves uh, rather abruptly uh, from the temple, uh, briefly disputing with the chief priest and the scribes there. And he heads back to Bethany. And then before the other bookend of that is, uh, ultimately before returning to ultimately uh, 
curse the fig tree, and then finally to go to the cross on your behalf and mine. He was headed to the cross. He was willing to go to the cross for your sins and mine. I, 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 I read in a devotional from Moody Bible Institute uh, yesterday morning, I believe it was, maybe Friday morning, and, and something was said in there that really hit me. Uh, this is not a quote, but something to the effect that the better we understand the Old Testament and all that went on in the Levitical uh, system and the, the system of, of sacrifices in that day, the better we're able to understand what Jesus accomplished. And I'm sure your pastor will be talking about uh, when he died on the cross for our sins. And I, I thought, just, that, that's just so important. I mean, when we realize what Christ was headed to, when we look at the passage before us and realize that really it's a tragedy that they missed it, if you will, because they didn't realize. And we need to realize today what Jesus was facing as he entered into Jerusalem on that day. We simply can't imagine the, the suffering the Lord of glory endured on our behalf. And his suffering didn't just start when they put a, a crown of thorns on his head or when he bore the cross to Calvary. But, but listen to me, he suffered deep anguish, uh, the anguish of facing his beloved Jerusalem and the hollow hosannas that would be offered as he's made his way to uh, the cross, ultimately, as he made his so-called triumphant entry. Imagine... Imagine being popular one minute, but knowing that in a matter of hours, the cries of the people would change so dramatically from the loud hosannas of Palm Sunday to the lewd screams of, you know it, crucify him, crucify him on Good Friday. On Sunday, they cheered him, but on Friday, they, they cursed him. On Sunday, he was their king, but on Friday, he was a criminal. On Sunday, it seemed all the world was for him, but on Friday, it seemed all the world wanted was him dead. Oh, the agony of it all. But, but did they not realize who he was? I wonder today, do we truly realize who he is and all he's done. Again, Matthew 21, 10. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? But before the multitude at Jerusalem, that first Palm Sunday, it was asked this question. The psalmist answered it in, in uh, Psalm uh, 24, verses uh, 8 through 10. Just, just listen to Psalm 24, 8 through 10. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Imagine that. He is the King of glory. What we want to see about this question then is that Jesus' triumphal entry to, to the cries of Hosanna was his first formal presentation of himself as their true king. Not the king they were looking for, but the king of glory. Heaven come down in human form in the person of Jesus Christ, the, the only Savior of the world. Notice once more they, their response to the question, who is this? They said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, Matthew 21, 11. Wrong. For you see, he's much more than the prophet of Nazareth. Here we, we truly see the spiritual blindness 
of this multitude, made up of those from Galilee, the Jews that lived in Jerusalem, and those who saw him even recently raise Lazarus from the dead. It was the Jews' Passover, and there were, were probably some, we're told, two million people uh, all crowded in and around uh, the city of David. All of this uh, is key to our Lord's timing as he, he makes his way again to the cross. Not only does he reveal his identity, for up until now, he had, had cautioned them, you remember, not to, to give him away. And on this uh, day, he, he planned uh, from eternity past, uh, Jesus makes it official who he is. He is the king of glory. But they still didn't understand. They, they, they just simply did not understand. I wonder today, in uh, Zechariah chapter 9, look at it on your bulletin, I think it is. Zechariah, maybe it's on the, the screen at this time. I can't see those. But, but look at, at, at what it says there. And we'll come back to it. But when we think about this, you remember Solomon, the son of David, the, the, the wisest man ever. You remember Solomon. Solomon, the son of, of King David, preceded Jesus as the first Jewish king back in 1 Kings chapter 1 on his, his daddy's royal mule when he was publicly celebrated uh, as the new king following his father David's reign. But even Solomon's entry into Jerusalem in that, uh, that sort of fashion on a lowly uh, donkey only pointed to Jesus' true kingship. He was, was not coming here in, in victory, but he was coming even as a lowly servant, uh, a servant king, if you will. And, and we don't usually associate the, the lowly donkey, a, a beast of burden with a king, but, but this was the royal animal of the Jewish kings. And, and, and its rider was supreme royalty, the king of heaven and earth. Even Jesus came in humility, the king of kings and lord of lords, and he sat upon this colt that had never been ridden. And yet he bore Jesus on that triumphal entry, even as one greater than Solomon and all political leaders ever was this king of glory. More than the presence of the, the mayor, uh, him who has dominion over all the beast was the rider who, who kept the colt under control, never been ridden before. And yet Jesus sat on him and, and entered as a servant. Oh, his, triumph, his entry was, uh, was not triumphal in the world's eyes, to be sure. For it led to his arrest and, we said, ultimately to his death. But from God's perspective, it was triumphal in that his death led to the accomplishment, listen, of our salvation. All of this is so closely tied together and, and very important. God's triumph over sin and death and over the ruler of this world, Satan himself, is, is, is presented to us today. At last, the king of glory presents himself in the city of the temple from which the whole nation was ruled. In the holy city, the city of King David, his father, and, and he who was rich for our sakes became poor, entering not on a white charger with the blare of trumpets led by a mighty army in regal robes, but on the symbol of peace to the cries of the common people and to the swishing of the palm branches that day. In their ignorance, they cried for the political Messiah, you see, enthusiastic over his popularity. He just raised Lazarus from the dead, after all. His power to heal was pretty impressive, wouldn't you say? To raise the dead, even. And despite their, their fervor, they, they didn't realize that before them that day stood no earthly king riding on a donkey, but the king of glory, as we've seen. And Matthew, in fact, is the gospel of the kingdom and is always concerned with the royalty of the, the, the man, Christ Jesus. He is the king whose right it is to, to reign not only over uh, 
his own people, but, but over the whole world. And, and listen to me, friend, of your heart today, your heart. Is your heart tender toward Jesus who gave it all for you? Gave up his life freely for you? There is a royal edict as he enters. The Lord hath need of them, verse 3, followed by loyal obedience. It says the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, verse 6. And then there is the literal fulfillment of the prophetic word of God. All this was done, verse 4, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. I want us to see today, it's very important, I said, and, and for us to truly consider just two things in Matthew 21, 5 that differ from the original prophecy as given to Zechariah 9, 9 by the Holy Spirit, now some 500 uh, years before in this setting. By comparing Matthew 21, 5 to Zechariah 9, 9, we discover two very significant facts that help to explain the ignorance and the unbelief of the multitude. And I think it's even indicative of, of, of hearts of people today that really just don't understand. I, I, I'm going to steal a little bit of my son's thunder but he had an opportunity to uh, have a conversation with a man. And this man was uh, from a different country, even from a different country of his native origin. And he, he said something to the effect to Chad, uh, you seem to be a religious man. And... Uh, he, he said, what is it about, you know, your God, however the man put it to him. And he, he said, can I ask you? And Chad said, I didn't say it out loud, but I said it in my mind, please do ask me. And he had an opportunity to share, and I, I, I won't, again, steal all this thunder, but, but, but just think about it. People today are ignorant of the fact that Jesus is God. The Son of God in, in, in living flesh who came to, to suffer and bleed and die, to live a, a, a sinless life before the, the, the world in that day and, 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 and die as the only sufficient sacrifice for our sin and be raised from the dead on the third day where he uh, is and, and, and is still alive and, and, and ascend back to his throne in, in heaven where, where he is today, where he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Do you get the impact of that? That's what we're talking about and they missed it. And people missed it today. They miss it every day because they're without a Savior. And oh, what a great time for us to, 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 to share the good news of the gospel, be it here or on the other side of the world as you are today. With our family, with our friends, with those we, 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 we don't even know and may, we may never see again. He is the King of glory. Praise God. He's the one true and living God who takes away the sin of the world. And so by comparing these two significant facts, we, we notice first in, in Zechariah 9.9, uh, 9, Rejoice greatly, you see that? And he is just and having salvation, are omitted from the, uh, this verse, Matthew 21.5. And, and it's interesting. Notice, had not the Holy Spirit given the Scripture, perhaps men would have likely quoted uh, Zechariah 9 in its entirety, 9.9. 9. But, but again, under the Holy Spirit's guidance, two very important clauses are left out here in our text for today. Let's look at rejoice greatly first. This part is left out, and well, it should be. For when Jesus beheld Jerusalem, 
uh, back in Luke 19, 41, it says uh, through verse 44, he wept over Jerusalem. What's left out? Rejoicing greatly. It is applicable or appropriate because Jesus, just prior to this, was weeping over Jerusalem. How could the people, had they really understood, truly rejoiced rightly in judgment with judgment so near? As we said, Jesus knew the solemnness of this hour. And long before he reached Bethpage or, or Jerusalem that day, he, he knew that the cross lay before him. I, I wish we had time to, for me to just attempt to explain the cruelty and describe the awful, sinful, gross, ruthless process of, of crucifixion. A terrible, terrible crucifixion. But as we said, Jesus knew the solemnness this hour long before he reached there, and he, he knew where he was headed and what he was facing on the cross. In fact, that Jesus revealed himself at Passover was no coincidence, but was only further fulfillment of the prophecy that required the Lamb of God to be crucified on Passover. No, his coming to Jerusalem on the donkey wasn't the time for rejoicing that Zechariah referred to, that will take place in his second coming, right? When he comes again. The next time, not in humility, the next time Israel sees her king, he will come in great power, the Revelation says, 1911 and following. But in, la in that day, he won't come as our sacrifice, but as our Savior, our true living Lord. And he will not come on an animal of peace, but on a, an animal of war, as he judges all unbelief. Oh, if you're there today, if you've never come to Jesus Christ, this is serious business. You're here for a purpose today, to hear that Jesus loves you. That Jesus came to die for your sins. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's nothing you can do to escape an eternal hell but to bow before Jesus Christ. Confess your sin. Agree with God that you're a sinner, unable to save yourself, and turn from your sin all the way around and to Jesus as your only Savior. If you're here today and you don't know him, this is for you. And he is coming again. And he will judge all unbelief. That's the only thing that can keep you from an eternity in glory with the king of glory, you see. But also admit, omitted from Matthew's account here, we said there was two things, is this second phrase, he is just and having salvation. Zechariah 9, in verse 9, his judgment and justice comes later, you see. He, he, he wasn't coming to judge in that day. He was coming, as it were, to, to plead with the people to realize who he was. Not some political re leader or ruler. Not one who could get them out of their suffering under the, 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 the rigid rule of Rome. But he was coming as a lowly servant, offering up his life as an atonement for sin. And at this point in history, Jesus came in mercy and grace. And here's the tragedy of Palm Sunday. Jesus did have salvation for them that day, but they refused to accept it. The Bible says he came to his own in John 1.1. 1, 1, and what? They refused to accept it. He came his own, on, to his own, and his own received him not. Salvation has the, <clears throat> the thought of victory. But it will be fulfilled in his second coming, I said, and, and, and that will, will be the culminating 
truly triumphant entry when he comes again. We want to be ready for that day. If you've missed it or didn't understand what I was saying before, you, you need to be ready. You, you must be ready for his second coming. It's possible that Jesus had never come into Jerusalem by this uh, route, we're told, in, at, at, as, as he came into Jerusalem at other times. Because he usually came in from the sheep gate. Appropriate, wasn't it? The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The gate through which the animals for sacrifice entered. That was Jesus. That's what this is all about. This time, remember, though, he, he comes as king, even though he would not be truly accepted. They were looking for the wrong kind of king. And very decisively, Jesus forces the issue. Not only the issue of his death, but their rejection of him as well. When the religious leaders saw the reaction of the people, they decided that, that just as they had with Lazarus, Lazarus had been dead, Jesus raised him from the dead, and they wanted to kill him again. The Jewish leaders realized that Jesus had to be done away with. The people, you see, acclaimed Jesus as their political king, shouting Hosanna, which means save now. Actually, they were repeating from Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26, which says, Sin now, prosperity, save us. That same word is translated here, Hosanna, in Matthew 21, 9. I thought about this. There's so much there. Does this not sound like the world today? Sin now, prosperity? Wow. I mean, that's what the world's all about. Sin now, prosperity. Save us from taxes. I don't know. Save us from the crooked leaders, political leaders. We're still missing it. The world's still missing it. The tragedy of Palm Sunday. The world doesn't know who Jesus is. And it's our responsibility to tell them, dear people. It's our responsibility. Because we are to share that which we've received. The Jews didn't acknowledge Jesus as they as truly their, their spiritual king. Their traditions led to their spiritual blindness and rejection of the only one who is just and who has and is salvation. But notice now with me at Matthew 21, verses 10 and 11. The city was moved to ask, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, we've already looked at it, the prophet of Nazareth. Don't miss this. Yes, he is prophet. But this falls short as well, for he is prophet, priest, and king. King Jesus. False religions, and there are many today, some of your number are presently witnessing where those false religions are dominant. Praise God for a mission-minded church. False religions say Jesus was a prophet, and many people say he was a, a good man, but before them that day was none other than God in human flesh. Again, tragically, they failed to say, this is our God, we will trust in him. They missed it. People are missing it today. Their shouts were, were for the son of David. They failed to truly believe even their own words. The Old Testament tells us that, that the line of David would, would produce Messiah, the one come to save his people from their sins. They were stirred up because of his power for a brief time, and at the moment he would deliver his people, they despised and rejected him. Alistair Begg says, But Christ's kingdom came not 
through self-exaltation or warfare, but through servanthood. Are you listening, church? Through apparent weakness, conquering apparent strength. Let me just say that again. It's not on the slide. Christ's kingdom came not through self-exaltation or warfare, but through servanthood, through apparent weakness, conquering apparent strength. Isn't that a picture of the tragedy of Palm Sunday on a lowly burden of beast, beast of burden, a lowly donkey? Jesus came, and that's how we're to serve. Understand, Jesus will come again. I hope I made that clear. And as he descends from heaven, sitting on a white horse in that day, his eyes will be, the Bible says, as a flame of fire. On his head will be many crowns. He will be clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is King of Kings, the Word of God, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords, John the Revelator says. That blood is the blood of the enemies of the cross, the enemies of God. Please just let the impact of that sink in a minute. His vesture dipped in blood. Oh, he shed his blood on on Calvary's cross, but but this blood is speaking about those, his enemies, who, who continue in unbelief and in their sin. And we have the recipe for their salvation, for their forgiveness. We need to share it every day, every opportunity. He is coming again. And in that day will all men see him who they pierced, and they shall bow down and worship him, the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And and look with me at at Luke 19. I mentioned it earlier, but Luke 19, just two verses there. I I, want to read those two verses, and and you can turn there. Luke 19, verses uh, 41 and 42. And when he was come near, he beheld the city. I mentioned it, and what? wept over it, saying, here's the tragedy of Palm Sunday. If thou hadst known, even now, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. People are still missing it today. Don't you miss it today. Get it today. Hear Understand, Jesus, again, loves you and gave himself for you. Would you, would you, you un- just understand the tragedy of, of, of this Palm Sunday, uh, that, that it's the same as it was in that day? Despite the enthusiasm, despite their, their being religious, the hosannas of today even are from fickle hearts. The praises are, are with reservation. There's a lot of commotion, but, but very little devotion. Jesus said, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouths and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And sadly, still today, people refuse to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Oh, today, what more would you have him to do? He completely fulfilled, we read about it, all prophecy, surely, Surely, this look at the tragedy of Palm Sunday is, is more than enough to display and dispel, display his, his greatness and goodness and love and kindness and saving power and dispel your unbelief today if, you're, if you've never come to him as, 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 as your personal Savior and Lord. If you've never come to that place, receive him as Savior. Believe on him. Confess and believe that Jesus is your Savior from your sin. Turn to Him today for forgiveness. And church, as Easter approaches, 
We'll be looking at Jesus' death, burial, and praise God, his resurrection. Amen. But if you're a believer, truly believe Jesus is all that he says he is. And serve him. Follow his example. Serve him with all your heart. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise and our service as we point others to him. That's what it's all about for the church. He's alive. Praise God, he is alive. And I, I hope I've made it clear he's coming again. And the Bible says, behold, today is the day of salvation if you don't know him. And if you know him, today is the day to humble yourself and serve him for his glory. Because he's coming, and I believe he's coming soon.